All right. Um. All right. You may turn to First Peter chapter three. We'll just read a some scripture to direct our focus as we start this morning. We'll be starting in verse eight of chapter three. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tender hearted, be courteous, not returning for evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear." having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. And we'll be spending some time in this persecution end of this passage this morning relative to our study in Galatians. But before we start that, let's uh, look to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we come to your word this morning, we are mindful again of the provision of it in our lives as that which is your thinking. It's the mind of Christ, the thinking that uh, would put us in line with your view of all things that you have revealed before us to come to understand. So we thank you for preserving it for us, and we thank you that you've also provided this ministry of the Spirit in our lives to guide and direct us into all truth as we walk in the Spirit, that our hearts might be illumined to a true understanding of what otherwise would just be words on a page. And it's our desire that you would move us along individually today in our walk with you and our understanding of your plan. We all have room to grow, Father, and uh, that that we might um, have clarity of understanding, clarity of communication this morning, and and looking into the word and we just uh, commit our time to you to the end that you would be honored and glorified in the in the end of all of our time and our devotion to the word of God in Jesus name we pray amen well last week we finished uh, with the doctrine of sowing and reaping which is the last of the doctrines that we have taken a detailed look at as we move through the book of Galatians But I was reminded of one thing I had intended to mention that I left out, so we'll spend a little bit more time on this this morning just to fill in that gap. Uh, We have to be careful in making direct connections between reaping and sowing. As we noted earlier, we tend to associate what appear as obviously negative consequences with the just desserts of uh, sowing to the flesh. That's our knee-jerk tendency. Job's friends were famously guilty of this when they insisted that Job's travails were simply a reaping of what he had sowed in some way. Now, each of the three friends either intimated or outright asserted this. Turn to Job 4, verse 7, where we find right out of the gate here early on in the book, after the narrative of the circumstances that overtook Job, we find this charge from one of his so-called three friends, Eliphaz the Temanite. And we're going to start in verse 7 and just read down through verse 9. He says, Remember now, who ever perished being innocent? Or where were the upright ever cut off? Even as I have seen those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. By the blast of God they perish, and by the breath of his anger they are consumed. 
So clearly, even more, most explicitly in verse 8, he said those who, you know, if you're suffering, if you're reaping trouble, then you have plowed iniquity somehow, Job. Now, Eliphaz's expression is consistent with many passages in Proverbs. And Eliphaz's assertion, along with the other friends, shows that the principles of sowing and reaping were well known from very early on in recorded biblical history. And why wouldn't they be? The original example of this is Adam and Eve. <laughs> and that would still be very fresh in the minds of those who are living through early biblical history. But is this a case of Job reaping what he sowed? That's a trick question here. It's a trick question. <laughs> Though true in the realm of ultimate justice concerning the sowing of wickedness, in terms of ultimate justice, we must remember that suffering in time is not always a manifestation of this. Turn to 2 Timothy 3.12. Passage that many have committed to memory, or at least can paraphrase. By way of principle, Paul says, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Because we have the benefit of seeing beyond the veil in the narrative of Job's situation, we find that he did reap what he had sown. <laughs> but just not in the way that his friends had laid it out. Job had sowed righteousness and reaped not judgment, but persecution. God allowed Job to be the target, as it were, of direct persecution. But why? God looks down and points out to Satan, look at Job, a righteous man. Job says, oh, I'll show you a righteous man. Okay, have your way with him. Job reaped what he sowed in a very different way than the direct application of the principle in the way that Job's friends uh, had put out there in their dialogue or their discussion with Job. And is there any wonder why the Lord would be so upset with them? And this will tie in shortly to the text of Galatians. Believers today who sow to the Spirit will be the targets of Satan, who will mobilize his forces including many people around us who might be unwitting players in this. He will mobilize his forces against them in the way, in whatever way and to whatever extent God allows. And this is one of the answers to the question, why do bad things happen to good people? And I use that in a generic sense, not in the worldly sense of we know that we're not good but good in the sense of those who are walking with the Lord. Why does God allow bad things to happen to those people? Okay, um, back to the text of Galatians. We are now moving into the last outline section of Galatians, the conclusion of the letter from chapter 6, verse 11 through verse 18. Let's start. We're going to read this section here just to have it before us, starting in verse 11. See with what, with, with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But God forbid that I should boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Now, looking at the text starting with verse 11, 
One of the ways we know Paul is concluding, among other things, is an abrupt seizing of the pen to finish this letter out himself. Now this whole, maybe you can imagine him doing it, this is in keeping with the overall tone of the letter and his almost desperate concern for what was happening in the Galatian churches. This is a good example of God's allowing of the human element to be manifest on the part of the writers of Scripture. This is a human you know, dramatic event, as it were, and, and God allows the writers, in their own personality and in their own approach, to, till, to still pen his word. And so this is kind of an, a, an example of that, maybe more dramatic than, than technical. Now, this is not the only place that Paul is moved to do this. We see this in other places. Turn back to 1 Corinthians 16, 21. And I'm going to quickly read through these just to show this connection. 1 Corinthians 16, 21, he says, The salutation with my own hand, Paul's. So he is there again. He's taken the pen and written this out himself from here on out to the end of the book of first, or letter of, to the 1 Corinthians or the Corinthians. Turn now to Colossians 4, 18. Colossians 4.18, he says, This salutation by my own hand, Paul, remember my chains, grace be with you, amen. And finally, a couple more books ahead to 2 Thessalonians 3.17. The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle, so I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now, I'm going to build on this particular one here, but first, apparently Paul would dictate his letters, and then he would typically sign them, as we see here specifically in 2 Thessalonians 3.17. He had someone that would, would uh, take dictation, and then at a certain point, he would take the pen and finish the letter by way of salutation or benediction. And this would serve as authentication of this communication to his recipients. And not necessarily emphasis, though the additional role of emphasis is much more evident in Galatians, the letter to the Galatians. Now there really isn't much we need to do by way of additional clarification as we go back to uh, Galatians 6 of this passage Rather than other than deal with a few particulars, and that's uh, speaking specifically of verse 11 here. First, Paul starts with the blunt charge to see how he has taken direct control of the pen for an important exhortation. So he he has said, "See how I have done this." The word for "see" is a Greek word that takes a particular form on the basis of its tense. In this case, it's the aorist tense and its mood. And in this case, it's the imperative mood. So it's a command. And here is how Vine summarizes the meaning of this word. The word see here. To see calls attention to what may be seen or heard or mentally apprehended in any way. Regularly rendered behold. And that behold, obviously, in and of itself is a stronger word in the English than the word see. So it's an apt perhaps better translation for us to get the sense of what Paul's urgency is here. Now, this word is routinely translated see, and it's found in a number of places in the New Testament. It's translated see with the emphasis on turning one's attention to something so as to perceive and to understand. It is also frequently translated no with particular emphasis then on the perceiving and understanding end of this. And we have examples of 
both of such uses in the book of Galatians itself. So we're going to go and look at these two. Turn back to chapter 2. They're both in chapter 2. Starting in verse 7. So we're, we're, our interest is in developing the understanding of this word see as Paul directs them, commands them. Verse 7, But on the contrary, when they saw, there's the word, that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter. And I'm going to stop there uh, because I think I can develop enough of it from that. We find that the apostles in this context, Paul is meeting with the apostles Peter, James, and John. And so when he says they saw, he's speaking of those apostles, those individuals. So we find that the apostles Peter, James, and John, upon turning their attention now, this is the whole idea, upon Paul, came to understand something important about his ministry. So the idea is behold, you know, they beheld, they, they, they examined and they saw and understood as they directed their attention to Paul laying out his ministry before them. And this is specifically reinforced in verse 9. It says, uh, And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, there's kind of the emphasis on that understanding part of seeing as Paul lays out his case before them. So they perceived, they understood where Paul fit into God's plan after beholding or paying attention. Okay, so that's the that's the word to see uh, there in verse se- um, seven, as translated as see. Now look in verse fourteen. And this is another use of the word as uh, translated to see. But when I saw, this is Paul now speaking, Paul saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel. I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Jew live in the manner of Gentiles and not as Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? So Paul, this is another situation where he beheld what was going on when he arrived in Galatia and saw that Peter had slipped into hypocrisy. So once he saw that to the point of understanding, he stepped in. So the idea is he saw, he he let it sink in, and he understood, and then he acted. Now for the translation of this word uh, by the word no, turn now to verse 16. Well, we'll start in verse 15. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus. And we'll stop there. So knowing, there's the word, but it's translated knowing. And, you know, we use the word seeing in the same sense, don't we? Oh, I see what you're saying. Well, you don't see what they're saying. You see to the point of understanding what they're saying. So in some cases, the word, the emphasis is on that side of, the, uh, of this word, Knowing, the knowing side, the coming to understand side. Clearly, the confidence of one's justification is rooted in a clarity of understanding that starts with setting one's focused attention on the grace gospel. And once you've focused on the grace gospel, you've beheld the grace gospel to the point of understanding, you know, you come to know with assurance and clarity where justification comes from. So, This Greek word is used in the figurative sense of seeing with the mind's eye with the ultimate aim of knowing. Okay, let's go back now to verse 11. So that's the issue with see. Come on, basically, you look carefully to the point of getting what I'm going to tell you now. Secondly, we find Paul referring to writing with large letters. Now, I understand that the King James might be a little misleading here in terms of Uh, it gives a sense of the possibility of interpreting Galatians as being a large letter itself, an extensive letter. But that's, we'll see not what Paul intends here. If you look in the other translations, uh, New King James and the New American Standard specifically, you get the sense clearly as you read it of what Paul speaks. 
He's referring to writing with large letters, and that simply means writing with large letters. <laughs> Vine goes to an extensive length in the figurative sense. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I lost my place. He, he goes to a great length in searching this out with respect to the Greek and the context. And it's pretty convincing in the way he lays it out uh, that you can take it as written. This is simply Paul referring to, to writing in larger print than what had preceded uh, by way of that which was dictated. Now it has been suggested that Paul's use of large letters was related to the possible eye issues that he had implied of himself earlier in Galatians 4.15. You know, if you remember, he said in, in talking personally to the Galatians, he said that they would have plucked their own eyes out and given them to him if they could. And so there was some sense, well, maybe he's got an eye problem and he's got to write with big letters. Now, this is also further connected by some with the thorn in the flesh that you're familiar with, described in 2 Corinthians 12.7. So some people say, oh, there it is. He's got an eye problem, and oh, it's also referred to in 2 Corinthians. That must be it. His thorn in the flesh is an eye problem. <laughs> well, sometimes we get too caught up in trying to connect biblical dots or read rational meaning into the text that may not be there, uh, and we simply fa fail to take things at face value. I mean, that's the way it should be taken unless there's a compelling reason to take it otherwise. You know, the Bible is, a, in some people's mind, a mystical, a difficult book, so there's got to be hidden meanings all over the place. So we've got to search this out and come up with some clever interpretation or absolute answer for something that seems to be uncertain, where there really isn't anything there. <laughs> Paul is simply saying, I want to make this very clear, so I'm going to write it myself and write it very large. <laughs> okay. And there's therefore no indication that Paul... That, that Paul's use of large letters had anything to do here uh, with anything more than emphasis on his message, as we ourselves might do in using all capitals. Right. Now, there are those who feel on the basis of the statement in verse 11, where he says, See with what, with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand, some take that statement to mean that he wrote the entirety of the book of Galatians, specifically because of the particular tense that he uses here with the have written. It's kind of in a past, past tense. But I read other very plausible explanations for this, and it seems very likely or more likely that Paul simply has expanded a bit on his normal approach or practice of signing his letters. As we've seen in 2 Thessalonians 3.17, it was normal for him to take the pen and sign it, as it were, and maybe with some extended exhortation. Here he has expanded on that a bit more. This is a much more extended uh, section of Scripture that he has written himself. In taking the pen in hand at this point, Paul does so for more than his typical benediction. He is really exercised, and he writes considerably more as he issues a final appeal to the Galatian believers. You can picture in your mind Paul speaking to someone, and he's he's thinking, you know, he's he's of course in the spirit, and he's dictating to this person. And he gets to a certain point, he's closing out, and he says, here, give me that pen. <laughs> he steps in and he <laughs> writes it out from that point forward. So that's basically what you have. He's, he's, all, he, he's recounting and recapping everything he has said. He wants to make one more final exhortation, and that whole emotion probably comes back as he thinks of what he has laid out before them. Uh, his charge to the Galatians is probably some of the most pointed, heated um, directives that we've seen Paul write. And so this, it seems to fit. So in summary, the essence of this verse is captured well by the Amplified Bible, which includes in its direct translation, it includes this parenthetically by way of explanation, simply, 
Mark carefully these closing words of mine. You know, it says, the idea of see with what, lar- with what large letters I am writing to you in my own hand. The idea is mark carefully these closing words of mine. And that's kind of the sense. That's the underlying uh, intent of Paul's point here. Okay, now moving on to verse 12. I'm going to read, reread verses 12 and 13. As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. Now, as we approach these two verses, we have an important matter of groundwork to address at the outset that requires us to look ahead in the text and has to do with an important characteristic of the subjects of Paul's writing. Paul's warning, as it were. Who are these people? They are referred to in these verses as those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh, those who would compel the Galatian believers to be circumcised, those who did not want to suffer persecution for the cross of Christ, those who did not keep the law though they were circumcised, and those who desired to have the Galatian believers circumcised that they may boast in their flesh. In fact, when you take all of those phrases together, these two verses are virtually defined by these phrases. There's very few additional words added beyond that in these verses. So this this is a complete focus on these individuals. So who are these individuals? We have referred to them as the Judaizers, which by way of definition associates them with attempts to impose various aspects of the Mosaic Code on believers in the church as a supposed means of attaining a standing before God. So the Judaizers were trying to bring the Mosaic Code and keep it as a standard by which even believers had to attain or hold in order to attain justification or or sanctification before God in their Christian lives. Now we have previously speculated that this particular group in this case was believers. And I think we find here in these two verses fairly clear indication that these Judaizers were believers. Whereas unbelieving Jews would have shared their convictions, the Judaizers' convictions regarding the need for keeping the law, this would not have been based on a desire to avoid persecution associated with allegiance to the cross of Christ. Now this might be a subtle point, but I think it's important to see this. These individuals that Paul is speaking of were seeking to avoid persecution for the cross of Christ. Jews wouldn't care about that. In fact, they're perpetrators of persecution on the basis of the cross of Christ. So we have individuals that are concerned about persecution in proclaiming the cross. The temptation to shrink back from such persecution is unique to the believer. We already saw this earlier in looking at 2 Timothy 3.12 where we read, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But we see this also clearly in the parable of the sower. Turn to Matthew 13.20 and we're on the explanation side of this parable. Matthew 13.20 We'll just read 20 and 21. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now the word of God that Christ refers to here specifically relates to the message of the cross. 
Now there would be, as I said, no concern on the part of Jews in avoiding the persecution of, of the cross. They do not believe the message of the cross. They were the primary perpetrators of persecution related to those who held to this message and were seeking to spread it. So it seems we have a group of believing Jews who have failed to put off certain remnants of Judaism. And we see references to this category of Jews in a number of places. Turn to John chapter 12, verse 42. John 12:42. 12, 42. We'll read down through 43. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Are we talking about believers here? This is not a trick question. <laughs> what does it say in verse 42? Among the rulers, many believed in him. Are they saved? Is there any reason to think that they're not saved in the way this word is used in the book of John? But, because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him. They hid their light under a bushel. They did not want to face persecution and more specifically, losing their place of privilege. Now, you can see a direct parallel here with Galatians 6, 12 through 13 and the desire of these individuals to avoid persecution on one hand and on the other, the desire to maintain the favor of men, especially of those who are in the religious power business. So, I think that's a helpful passage to see a parallel. Now, I'll turn to Acts chapter 15, verse 1. And this is even more clear by way of historical context because it places these individuals shoulder to shoulder with Paul. Verse 1, And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria describing the conversion of the Gentiles and they caused great joy to all the brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders and they reported all things that God had done with them with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. There is no doubt by virtue of a clear statement in verse 5 that there was an abiding group of Jewish believers that held to circumcision and presumably other facets of the Mosaic Code, but, but primarily circumcision into the time frame of the early church, something that is also implicit in the challenge that we see to the readers of the book of Hebrews. They had lapsed as Jewish believers into uh, resuming practices, Ju Judaistic practices, aimed at deriving for themselves or maintaining a right standing with God. Note that Paul and Barnabas entered into no small dissension and dispute with them. Does that sound anything like the sentiments toward them he conveys in his letter to the Galatians? And this is the way legalism must be confronted. This is the way legalism must be confronted, even among believers. And we will talk about this more as we get through both these verses um, in terms of application. So having established the likelihood that Paul is addressing a problem within the church involving those of the church, let's go back to Galatians 6. These are most likely believers he's talking about here. These Judaizers, based on the terms he's used, based on the historical context, based on, based on confirmation that this really 
could be the case and has happened, had happened, these appear to be believers. And let's move on now to look at the text. And, as I, and I found the outline that was offered by Dr. Jeremiah to be very helpful for this. He labels the overall passage here, the hidden motives of the persecutors. And he presents four ways in which this is laid out before us in these two verses. He cites the motives as the approval of the people, verse, the first part of verse 12, the avoidance of persecution, verse 12, the second half of verse 12, the appearance of perfection, 13, the beginning of verse 13, and the attitude of pride, second half of 13. It's always great to use alliteration. You see how he did that? <laughs> you know, sometimes we strain to make that fit. <laughs> sometimes it comes and it works, and in this case it works pretty well. So this is what we're going to follow as we go through the text. This gives you an upfront kind of sense of where these, where Paul is going. So let's start with the approval of the people. And we'll read the first part of verse 12 again that relates to this. As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised. We are already familiar with certain words here in the way Paul uses them in Galatians. I don't intend to rehash all the, the Greek here on words that are from, uh, we've seen. What I'll do is I'll review where we, we need to. For instance, when he speaks of flesh here, it's used not in the physical sense of our bodies, but in the spiritual sense as in the energy of the flesh. The capacity of the old sin nature to continue to produce and manifest human good through law keeping or good works. So that's the, the idea here. And he uses circumcision here, speaks of circumcision, both as a literal, uh, in its literal sense, but also as representative of the whole Mosaic Code, in whole or in part, as a way of the spiritual life. Circumcision is kind of the emblem of the Mosaic Code and its practical outworking. So when he uses circumcision, it's both in the discrete, literal sense, but also as a representative sense. The word, now, now we're going to look at a new word here. The word for good showing, or fair show, as in the King James Version, is the Greek word euprosopeo. Euprosopeo. It is found only here. This is the only use of it in the New Testament. But through its compound, and, and that typically makes it more difficult to, by context, or by extended context, by multiple use, to find its meaning. But because of its compound parts, the simplicity of it, the meaning falls out fairly naturally. The, um, it's a compound of you, E-U, and prosopon, prosopon. You as a prefix is, is good, it means good. And prosopon means a face. And it's the verb form. So literally, it's to put forth a good face. That's literally. To, here it is. They want to put forth a good face. But more suitably and understandably, according to Vines and BibleStudyTools.com, it means to make a fair show or simply to please. And the power, therefore, you know, the, the word to please, that's pretty mundane. But you pros upon, that's a pretty... Uh, descriptive word if you take it in the Greek. And that's the power of the Greek. It sometimes uses compound words that elicit images that give you a more powerful sense of what Paul is intending. So the idea is put to put on a good face. You can kind of imagine that. Whereas to please, okay, fundamentally it means to please, but boy, to put on a good face, I mean, you can kind of picture that. Well, that's the power of the Greek. And uh, and, and here, it simply connects with the fleshly tendency toward the approbation of man that we all have. We have this, uh, the, this facet of the Olson nature that has a tendency to want to please man, to get on the good side of man. 
this tendency, of course, is not concerned um, is concerned with pleasing man. Uh, it's well, I gotta see what I did to myself here. This is a tendency, as I said, that we all have. It's the tendency that was subjected to the Spirit when Peter and John refused to submit to the religious leaders in refraining from preaching the gospel. If you remember that in Acts, some time ago in the Acts study, Peter and John were arrested and brought before the religious leaders, and they were directed not to continue to preach the gospel message. And Peter responds, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. So the idea is this tendency that they might have had, the fleshly tendency to kowtow or to put on a good face before the religious leaders was subjected to the spirit and instead they chose to please God and not please man. Instead, on the Judaizers' part, they wanted to further cover and by it control. I should say they wanted further cover. They themselves wanted further cover. They wanted to expand their base of cover for their own uh, failure to uh, walk with the Lord in a manner pleasing to Him according to the Spirit. They were looking for broader cover. And this is a tendency also. If you are not walking in truth, Surround yourself with more people that aren't walking in truth and you won't feel quite so bad. The conviction won't be there. So they wanted further cover and by this they wanted further control or they had to control. And they sought to compel the Galatian believers to follow their legalism. And primarily this was conducted through the outward act of circumcision. You know, Gentiles would not have been circumcised. So this would be something new to them and be something that's outwardly demonstrable that showed that these believers were now lining up with the Judaizers. This word for compel, these would compel you to be circumcised, bears the sense of some form of a strong threat, either direct or implied. The fearful implication being that without this step, the step of circumcision and perhaps other aspects of the Mosaic Code, the believer would not attain assurance of a right standing before God. So that's the threat. That's a pretty severe threat. That's a pretty tough thing for young believers to handle. If, if their salvation assurance is put in doubt, they want to recover that. They want to find a way to maintain that. That's probably one of the primary uh, um, impulses in the, in the life of the young believer and sometimes comes around again as you're growing in the Lord. The idea is, well, we got to keep, that's got to be nailed down. And we want to make sure we're right here. So that threat was used to leverage compliance or compel the Galatians to, to follow after the Judaizers in the rite of circumcision. Now we have, um, again, two examples of this word used in Galatians. For the direct approach of compulsion, let's go back again to chapter 2, verse 3. Again, I'm just going to break into the context and pull this out. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Again, this is um, Paul resisting on behalf of Titus attempts uh, to have Titus in a similar fashion to the way the Galatians were being compelled to be circumcised. So that's a direct compulsion. And again, this is akin to what the Judaizers are doing in Galatia. But for the more indirect approach, look at verse 14. And this is uh, the situation again of Peter, Peter's hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? 
Now, I say indirect here because Paul, Peter was probably not actively lining them up to live and laying out the rules. But it's his example that was set before the people that put the pressure on them. It was his hypocrisy in living a certain way or kowtowing to the Judaizers that itself indirectly influenced the Galatian believers. Peter's complicity in this served as a powerful coercion upon the Gentile believers there. Now I'm going to address the contemporary implications of this in a summary section, but suffice it to say now, this is no different than the particular ways in which some impose insecurity upon believers today. Okay, I think I'm not going to get started here. We're ready to move into the avoidance of persecution as the second motivation, but I have too much on that to squeeze into four minutes, so we will hold off and give you a little extra time. As I said, there's a lot of uh, implications of this and, and specific application relative to our present day. You might think, well, circumcision, that's irrelevant. Mosaic law, that's irrelevant. Well, it really, it might be in the strict form that we see it here, but it is much more relevant uh, in, in directly relevant than we might make connection initially with some of the things that we see today that have uh, advanced legalism and particularly insecurity in the lives of believers that we want to make connection with. So we're going to get through the rest of these before we get to the application. So we'll, we'll pick up with the avoidance of persecution next time, next week. So let's, let's close now. Father, we thank you for your grace. We know that it's your grace that cuts through all of these things and enables us to come to even understand it in truth because of your patience and your provision of your grace poured out upon us independent of, of many, many times our response to it. And so we're very grateful for your patience with us uh, and we Thank you for the simplicity many times of what you've laid before us. And just help us to take these things at face value that we might derive the immediate and full benefit from them as we do. And we thank you now for the balance of our time and we commit the balance of our morning, our day to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.